This video is intended to give emergency responders the information they need to know about anhydrous ammonia. This video will provide you with the information you need to know when responding to an agricultural incident involving anhydrous ammonia. Anhydrous ammonia is a concentrated form of ammonia used in a variety of agricultural and industrial applications. For these uses, ammonia is often transported and used in its anhydrous form as a liquefied compressed gas. Anhydrous means without water, so in this form, ammonia is very corrosive and can cause serious injury or be fatal if inhaled, ingested, or absorbed by the skin. Under normal conditions, it can be transported, handled, and used safely. Safe use of our products is the number one priority of the fertilizer industry. And while those who handle, transport, and store anhydrous ammonia receive regular training, an incident may occur. This video is designed to help you identify anhydrous ammonia's basic properties and its uses, build awareness on how to respond to an agricultural anhydrous ammonia incident, perform first aid in the event of anhydrous ammonia exposure, and establish emergency plans. In this video, the first module provides an introduction to the anhydrous ammonia first responder video. This includes an overview of anhydrous ammonia, how to recognize the product and protect yourself, and how to safely respond to an agricultural anhydrous ammonia incident. More detailed information on anhydrous ammonia identification and characteristics, responding to an incident, and environmental issues are provided in Modules 2 through 5, followed by a summary in Module 6. Module 4 covers safe response to an agricultural and hydrous ammonia incident, which includes information on placards and safety marks, hazard and risk assessment, assessing ammonia levels, personal protective equipment, securing the scene, emergency response plans, emergency assistance, and first aid. Anhydrous ammonia is widely used across Canada in a range of agricultural and industrial applications. Anhydrous ammonia is manufactured in large industrial facilities. Anhydrous ammonia has many uses and is most commonly used for the following. As a highly effective fertilizer, primarily in Western Canada. It is applied in liquid form through injection into the soil using specialized farming equipment to grow crops. As a refrigerant, anhydrous ammonia is used in ice rinks, meat packing plants, and cool stores. Refrigeration for cooling in freezers and fridges is found in grocery stores. It's also used as a building block for a variety of other products, including glues, dyes, and household cleaners. Ammonia has two forms, gas and liquid. At room temperature and pressure, anhydrous ammonia is a gas. For agricultural use, anhydrous ammonia is stored and transported under pressure in liquid form. The tanks used to contain anhydrous ammonia are pressure vessels and may include fixed storage tanks, rail cars, transport trucks, and tanks designed for agricultural use called nurse wagons. Ammonia may also be found in very large refrigerated tanks at industrial facilities and in gas cylinders in the refrigeration industry. For the purpose of this video, we're focused on incidents involving anhydrous ammonia for agricultural use. In review, anhydrous ammonia is widely used as a fertilizer in agriculture, in refrigeration, and it is also used as a building block for a variety of other products. It is stored and transported as a liquid under pressure and may be found in both rural and urban locations. In this section, we'll review how to identify anhydrous ammonia should an incident occur. As you are aware, in any incident, you must be able to identify which product is involved and understand its basic properties to know how to safely respond. How do you know a vessel such as a transport delivery unit, ammonia rail car, or field nurse wagon unit contains anhydrous ammonia? Anhydrous ammonia is regulated by Transport Canada under the Transportation of Dangerous Goods Act and regulations. According to these regulations, anhydrous ammonia's classification is Class 2.3, subclass 8, meaning it is a compressed gas with toxic and corrosive properties. The product's UN number, a four-digit number that identifies the dangerous good, is 1005. As a Class 2.3, anhydrous ammonia is a toxic inhalation hazard, TIH. All ammonia vessels must have the proper identification, including a placard, so that a vessel can be quickly identified to be carrying anhydrous ammonia. 
The words anhydrous ammonia, inhalation hazard, must also be found on the vessels. Tanks may also have wording such as caution ammonia or danger ammonia, depending on various provincial rules or previous industry practices. The Emergency Response Guidebook, ERG 2016 edition, provides information for first responders on initial actions to take in the event of a release of anhydrous ammonia. You should be familiar with how to use the ERG and the recommended actions. What should you expect in the event of a release of anhydrous ammonia? Ammonia has an extremely pungent odor and is easily detectable even in very low levels. This is ammonia's most identifiable property, which provides an excellent warning as it will often be smelled before it's seen. An anhydrous ammonia plume may also be seen if the humidity is high enough. The reason the plume is seen is because it's drawing moisture from the air. If anhydrous ammonia escapes from its containment, it turns immediately into a gas and blows with the wind as it dissipates. However, this is not true if the temperature is below minus 28 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 32 degrees Celsius. It may form a white plume or it may be invisible. You must act on the assumption that there is ammonia gas or vapor downwind of a release. Anhydrous ammonia has a high affinity towards water. Thus, it is extremely important to protect yourself as it will attack areas of high moisture such as your respiratory system, eyes, and skin. In review, anhydrous ammonia is regulated by Transport Canada under the Transportation of Dangerous Goods Acts and Regulations, identified by white placards with the UN number 1005 and the words inhalation hazard. Anhydrous ammonia has an extremely pungent odor and, if released from its containment, will vaporize immediately and drift downward. It is a serious inhalation hazard. Once you've identified the product involved in the accident, your next consideration must be to protect yourself and others from it. The primary hazard with anhydrous ammonia is inhalation, so in the event of a release, it's vital to maintain an adequate distance from the ammonia vapor. Ammonia is corrosive in nature and will produce chemical burns to the eyes, lungs, and skin. This type of burn is susceptible to an infection. Responding to an incident with proper equipment and procedures is vital as exposure to high concentrates of ammonia can be deadly. Anhydrous ammonia is considered toxic by inhalation, TIH, and the Emergency Response Guidebook provides a table of initial isolation and protective action distances. Refer to this information to determine the distances that are recommended to isolate and protect persons downwind. Remember that anhydrous ammonia gas that has escaped from its containment may not be visible depending on the humidity and temperature. Anhydrous ammonia plumes will dissipate downwind. If you approach a release of anhydrous ammonia from downwind without suitable personal protective equipment, you may become a casualty. Please note that firefighter turnout gear or bunker suits are not adequate protection for an anhydrous ammonia emergency. Turnout gear is designed to breathe, so ammonia vapor or water contaminated with ammonia could pass through the suit and contact the skin, producing chemical burns. This could also destroy the vapor barrier in the firefighter gear. For entry into high concentrations or when levels of anhydrous ammonia are unknown, fully encapsulated suits with self-contained breathing apparatus are required for safety. Rescue methods must be left to train personnel equipped with the appropriate personal protective equipment. Ammonia burns must be treated with water. Continue to flush the burn with water to draw out all the ammonia and always seek medical attention. If a person has inhaled ammonia, it's essential to get emergency medical help since there could be injury to the lungs. If anhydrous ammonia has been ingested, rinse mouth and do not induce vomiting. Immediately call the poison center or seek medical attention. In review, anhydrous ammonia is an inhalation hazard which can produce chemical burns to the eyes, lungs, and skin and can also be deadly at high vapor concentrations. Stay upwind from an incident and only enter the area with the proper personal protective equipment. Remember, your first priority in an incident is to keep yourself and others safe.
Once you have identified that there's an ammonia incident and you are properly protected to handle the situation, the next priority is to secure the scene to minimize the potential injury to the public. Since ammonia vapors travel with the wind, the immediate and downwind locations must be secured. If the release is large, dangerous concentrations of ammonia vapors may be found several kilometers away. Shelter in place should be considered in any response. This is a vital technique for people in buildings downwind and requires all windows and doors to be shut. As well, residents are required to stay inside until the site is deemed safe. All options require consideration in every incident. Evacuation is also a valid technique, provided evacuation is not into or through a dangerous concentration of anhydrous ammonia. Only those with specialized knowledge, training, and equipment should be allowed to enter the restricted warm or hot zone to help mitigate the release of anhydrous ammonia and aid in the situation. Keep all other personnel out of the restricted zone. In review, remember the main hazard in an anhydrous ammonia incident is inhalation, both at the scene and downwind from the release. The focus must be on keeping people out of those zones until the incident is controlled. Refer to ERG, Table of Initial Isolation and Protective Action Distances. The inhalation hazard presented by anhydrous ammonia means that rescue and mitigation be done by properly trained and equipped personnel. Canutech is the Canadian Transport Emergency Centre operated by Transport Canada. Canutech can provide information and advice on the dangerous good and can provide contact information for emergency response personnel trained and equipped for dealing with dangerous good emergencies. For agricultural and hydrous ammonia, manufacturers and retailers of the product can provide expertise and have trained emergency response capacity. All agricultural operations handling anhydrous ammonia are required to have an emergency response plan. Emergency contact information should be available at the site or on the bill of lading for transportation incidents. In an incident involving anhydrous ammonia where there is no release of product, for example a road accident where a vehicle is transporting anhydrous ammonia as a means of containment, the response remains the same. A perimeter must be established as the product is stored under pressure and the integrity of the containment is not known. Anhydrous ammonia containing equipment should not be disturbed until expert help is available. Remember to check the wind direction when setting the perimeter. If possible, pre-planning with facilities that manufacture or use anhydrous ammonia is a key activity and can dramatically improve emergency response methods in an incident. This is especially true in smaller centers where hazmat expertise may be less readily available. In review, remember mitigation of an anhydrous ammonia emergency should be left to properly trained and equipped personnel. First response should focus on securing the scene and initiating the emergency response plan. And hydrous ammonia is a commonly used agricultural fertilizer and industrial chemical. In small concentrations, it's not harmful, but in high concentrations, it can cause injury and lead to death. Anhydrous ammonia is stored and transported under pressure as a liquid, but expands to a gas on release. The main hazard of an anhydrous ammonia release is inhalation. Rescue and leak mitigation must be left to properly trained and equipped personnel who can be summoned by activating the ERAP associated with the transport vessel or fixed facility. Remember, focus on correctly identifying the product, protecting yourself, securing the area, and obtaining expert assistance. This module briefly describes what anhydrous ammonia is, how it's made, and what it's used for. Anhydrous ammonia is a naturally occurring compound composed of nitrogen and hydrogen with the chemical formula NH3. Anhydrous ammonia is essentially pure ammonia. Anhydrous means it has very little water in it, typically about 0.2%. Earth's atmosphere is made up of gases, of which approximately 78% is nitrogen. And hydrous ammonia production uses the naturally occurring nitrogen found in the air combined with hydrogen, which generally comes from natural gas, although it can be produced from other hydrocarbons such as coal. And hydrous ammonia is manufactured in large-scale chemical plants. The first step is to isolate the hydrogen source. Natural gas is mixed with steam and heated in a furnace to break up the molecules and release the hydrogen. 
Air is added and a mixture of nitrogen, hydrogen, and carbon dioxide is obtained. The carbon dioxide is separated and in most cases is used for urea production. Urea is a solid form of nitrogen fertilizer. The nitrogen and hydrogen mixture is circulated through a converter where they combine to form ammonia. The ammonia is cooled and condensed into a liquid form and stored at minus 33 degrees Celsius in large refrigerated storage tanks. And hydrous ammonia is widely used across Canada in a range of agricultural and industrial applications. And hydrous ammonia has many uses. It is most commonly used for the following as a highly effective fertilizer primarily in Western Canada. It is applied in liquid form through injection into the soil using specialized farming equipment to grow crops. As a refrigerant, anhydrous ammonia is used in ice rinks, meat packing plants and coolers in food stores. It's also used for a wide variety of other purposes including household products, waste management and in the production of other fertilizers and synthetic products. When shipped to customers, the ammonia is at ambient temperature and delivered in pressure vessels by transport delivery units and rail cars. Agri-retailers store ammonia in large storage vessels and transfer it to transport delivery units and then to smaller portable tanks called nurse wagons or from storage vessels directly into nurse wagons. Farmers apply anhydrous ammonia directly through injection into the soil using specially designed applicators. Safety and security are top priorities for the fertilizer industry. As such, Fertilizer Canada has developed a code of practice for anhydrous ammonia. All anhydrous ammonia agri-retail sites in Canada that are supplied by Fertilizer Canada manufacturer members must be fully compliant with the standard outlined in the ammonia code of practice. This applies to agricultural ammonia, including road and rail transportation, storage and handling of products. It outlines best practices applicable to the distribution, storage and handling of anhydrous ammonia to ensure safety and security. This section provides information on the basic properties of anhydrous ammonia. The more you know about the product, the better you can help in case of an emergency. In order for anhydrous ammonia to be used in its liquid state, it must be converted from gas to liquid. The boiling point of anhydrous ammonia is minus 33 degrees Celsius. Because of this low boiling point, anhydrous ammonia will immediately vaporize when it's released from its containment. To keep anhydrous ammonia in a liquid state, it is stored and transported under pressure. The vapor pressure at 21 degrees Celsius is 7,500 millimeters of mercury or 9.8 atmospheres equivalent to 888 kilopascals or 128 pounds per square inch. It's important to note that increases in temperature will increase the pressure in a vessel and decreases in temperature will decrease the pressure. Adding water to liquid anhydrous ammonia releases heat, so caution must be taken if adding water to a spill. If there's a pool of liquid ammonia on the ground, cover it with a tarp if it is safe to do so to minimize heat input and slow the rate of vaporization. Adding water will increase the rate of vaporization, making the outcome much worse. Never add water to a tank containing anhydrous ammonia. The ammonia will boil vigorously and the heat released will increase the pressure in the vessel. Ammonia is flammable within a limited range of 16 to 25 percent by volume in air. The auto ignition temperature is 650 degrees Celsius. Cases of ignition of ammonia are very rare. The expansion ratio is 800 to 1, meaning that 1 liter of liquid anhydrous ammonia will form 800 liters of vapor. The absorption ratio is 1,300 to 1, meaning that 1,300 liters of ammonia vapor will dissolve in 1 liter of water. The vapor density is 0.71 grams per liter at 25 degrees Celsius, meaning that it is slightly lighter than air. Thus, in normal conditions, a vapor cloud of ammonia will move with the wind and dissipate quickly. However, with high humidity, the vapor will take on moisture and could settle and linger in low-lying areas.
This section goes through a step-by-step process of how to safely respond to an agricultural and hydrous ammonia incident. And hydrous ammonia is classified by Transport Canada as a dangerous good, and thus is regulated under the Transportation of Dangerous Goods Act and regulations when transported by rail, ship, and road. Under these regulations, and hydrous ammonia's classification is class 2.3, subclass 8, meaning it's a compressed gas with toxic and corrosive properties. The product's UN number, a four-digit number that identifies the dangerous good, is 1005. As a class 2.3, anhydrous ammonia is a toxic inhalation hazard, TIH. Anhydrous ammonia is transported in liquid form under pressure in different sized pressure vessels. It can be transported by rail car, road transport truck, transport delivery units, or in nurse wagons. All vessels containing anhydrous ammonia in Canada will display a white placard with the number 1005 in the middle, a gas cylinder on top, and the number 2 at the bottom. The words anhydrous ammonia inhalation hazard must also be found on the vessels. Before approaching a vessel or incident, be sure to identify the product you're dealing with. If safe to do so, identify the vessel involved in the incident and read the placard and safety marks to identify its contents. In case of transportation emergency, remember to contact the 24-hour phone number located on the shipping document. The driver may also have a copy of the SDS or safety data sheet and the bill of lading, which provides useful information such as the properties of anhydrous ammonia, how to handle a spill, and important first aid measures. The Emergency Response Guidebook also provides valuable information. Remember your priorities in an agricultural incident involving anhydrous ammonia. People are first, then the environment, and finally property. Work with the technical advisors identified in the ERAP, the local agri-retailer or manufacturer. To properly identify the hazards involved and to assess the risk to those in the area, use the following decision-making process. First, gather as much information as you can. This can be from the agri-retailer involved, the vehicle's driver, or from a witness. Determine a timeline of the incident, when it happened, what is the presumed cause, determine if anyone is hurt, how much product is involved, and the condition of the vessel. Remember, when assessing an incident, take note of the weather conditions and always remain upwind of an anhydrous ammonia leak. Second, look for any hazards. Determine what is at risk in the situation and how risky is it. Are there people directly downwind from a leak? Is an almost empty nurse tank on its side or is a fully loaded semi-trailer in the ditch already venting ammonia vapor? Third, analyze the risk and assess what can be controlled based on your ability and the resources available. Do not enter a situation that you cannot control or you will just add another victim to the incident. Keep yourself and others safe and do only what you can. Fourth, develop a strategy with those that have technical knowledge and information. Once you know what you can do, develop a plan. Outline what has to be done in order of importance and leave yourself open to a few options as new information is available, more help arrives, or weather conditions change. Fifth, communicate the plan to everyone. There must be one objective only, one person in charge, and everyone working towards the same goal. Lastly, remember the plan should be a living document. As conditions change, the plan should be revised. It may be most effective to plan to take action step by step. As one task is accomplished, move on to planning the next task. This allows for flexibility as the conditions change. In any incident, working together with one agenda will increase the potential of a safe, effective, and efficient response. There are various types of monitoring equipment available, but it's rare that an emergency responder to a rural agricultural incident would have them on hand. The majority of the time, first responders to the scene will have to rely on the visual and odor clues to indicate the presence of ammonia. Remember that at very low concentrations, you can smell anhydrous ammonia in the air. This property of ammonia gives excellent warning that there is ammonia present. Depending on the conditions, there can be levels of anhydrous ammonia without any visual cues. Do not make any assumptions. If there is an odor, there is to be no entry until proper personal protective equipment is determined. An approach must always be from upwind. At high concentrations, anhydrous ammonia may be visible as a white cloud. 
There are three release formations to keep in mind. Trace gas, cloud, and pooled liquid. Trace gases are not visible, but you can smell them. Since this can still pose a risk to eyes and lungs, it's important to wear proper personal protective equipment to assess the situation. Level B personal protective equipment is appropriate for assessment purposes, but not for intervention. An ammonia cloud may be visible as a white cloud. These are extremely dangerous and can cause immediate injury. Ammonia vapor poses a serious inhalation hazard. Aerosols in the cloud can be extremely cold and will freeze skin on contact. Pooled liquid is also extremely dangerous. Ammonia chills as it evaporates, so it can form liquid pools at the point of release. Pools will be visible as clear liquid that is vaporizing to a dense cloud. Use water cautiously as this will promote vapor production and can only make the situation worse. Cover the pooled liquid and treat the spill in controlled quantities. Positive pressure, ventilation fans, and leaf blowers can be used to dilute and disperse ammonia vapors. Remember, anhydrous ammonia is easily detectable by smell and your primary warning is based on odor. Always get upwind to assess a situation and secure others. Shelter in place or evacuation may be the most effective methods to keep people safe. Low concentrations of anhydrous ammonia are easily detected due to its pungent odor. 25 parts per million is the personal protective equipment threshold 1, which means that below 25 parts per million, no respiratory protective equipment is required. However, we always recommend the use of personal protective equipment when responding to an incident with a release or potential release of anhydrous ammonia. Any exposure at or above 25 parts per million means that respiratory protection must be worn. Appropriate respiratory protection is a full-face respirator with ammonia cartridges for concentrations up to threshold 2, 300 parts per million. And hydrous ammonia at 300 parts per million is immediately dangerous to life and health, known as an IDLH level. Below 300 parts per million, a full-face respirator equipped with ammonia cartridges is appropriate. Above 300 parts per million, only self-contained breathing apparatus or other supplied air respiratory protection is appropriate. Other personal protective equipment may include level A or level B chemical protection. High concentrations of ammonia cause caustic damage to human tissue, especially areas of high moisture including eyes and lungs. At 5,000 parts per million, just a few minutes of exposure to anhydrous ammonia will lead to death from asphyxia or pulmonary edema. In summary, no respiratory protection is required at levels below 25 parts per million of anhydrous ammonia. A full face cartridge type respirator is required as a minimum between 25 parts per million and 300 parts per million. Supplied air respiratory protection is required over 300 parts per million together with chemical suits appropriate for the situation. Note, in general, any filtering respirators may only be used when oxygen is greater than 19.5%. If not, a self-contained breathing apparatus must be used. While it is unlikely that emergency responders will have the correct personal protective equipment for every chemical emergency, this section provides an outline of the protective equipment that's commonly used for ammonia. Remember, the main hazard associated with anhydrous ammonia is damage to the lungs from inhalation of vapor. The eyes can also be seriously damaged by either gaseous or liquid ammonia. If liquid ammonia is splashed onto the skin, it will cause severe chemical burns. Remember, anhydrous ammonia is stored and used under pressure. Personnel who handle ammonia in the agricultural industry wear personal protective equipment that will enable them to survive an accidental release of ammonia without serious injury and to escape the immediate area of the release. The equipment used by personnel handling ammonia in the agricultural industry consists of a full-face respirator equipped with an ammonia filter cartridge or canister, a one- or two-piece ammonia-resistant chemical suit, ammonia-resistant gauntlet-style gloves, and work boots. Note that cartridges or canister-type respirators are used primarily for immediate protection for workers and for escape purposes. Please note that firefighter turnout gear or bunker suits are not adequate protection for intervention in an anhydrous ammonia emergency. Turnout gear is made to breathe, so ammonia vapor or water contaminated with ammonia can pass through the suit and contact the skin, 
producing chemical burns. Turnout gear with a self-contained breathing apparatus, SCBA, is acceptable for the assessment of an emergency situation, but not for intervention. Remember to always approach an anhydrous ammonia release from upwind and uphill to minimize exposure. Binoculars can be used to assess a scene from a safe distance. Intervention and mitigation of an emergency must only be performed by qualified personnel, most likely in level A or B protective clothing and a self-contained breathing apparatus. If a responder is using level B protective clothing, additional measures must be used, such as a positive pressure ventilation fan or water stream, to direct or dilute the released product. In summary, the correct personal protective equipment for daily operations with anhydrous ammonia is a full-face respirator equipped with an ammonia cartridge, a one- or two-piece ammonia-resistant chemical suit, ammonia-resistant gauntlet-style gloves, and safety boots. Traditional turnout gear and self-contained breathing apparatus is appropriate only for assessment purposes. Intervention and mitigation must be left to properly trained and equipped personnel. Once you have identified that there is an ammonia incident and you are properly protected to handle the situation, the next priority is to secure the scene to minimize the potential injury to others. Since ammonia vapors travel with the wind, the immediate and downwind locations must be secured. If the release is large, dangerous concentrations of ammonia vapors may be found several kilometers away. Shelter in place is a vital technique for people in buildings downwind. This requires all people in buildings downwind to shut all windows and doors and remain in their residence until they're notified that it's safe to leave. Evacuation is also a valid technique, provided evacuation is not into or through a dangerous concentration of anhydrous ammonia. Only those with specialized knowledge, training, and equipment should be allowed to enter the restricted area to help mitigate the release of anhydrous ammonia and aid in the situation. Keep all other personnel out of the restricted area. In review, remember the major hazard when an anhydrous ammonia incident occurs is inhalation, both at the scene and downwind from the release. The focus must be on keeping people out of those areas until the incident is controlled. Refer to the ERG tables 1 and 3 of initial isolation and protective action distances. Handling an anhydrous ammonia emergency is a complex issue. It can involve a variety of people and resources, including those immediately responsible for the incident. Agri-retailers, manufacturers, emergency services, and provincial and federal agencies must work together in a concise and efficient manner to minimize injury to people and mitigate damage to the environment. Each facility supplying anhydrous ammonia has various types of emergency response plans that outline the steps to follow in case of an emergency. The emergency response plan will cover site emergencies, transportation emergencies, customer-related emergencies, environmental impacts, security, and theft. Facility plans also have an emergency contact list that outlines the people and businesses within a minimum of 5 kilometer radius and their contact information. This information is critical to minimize the impact of an emergency by getting the correct assistance in a timely manner. If the incident is on a highway, the driver of the vehicle will be able to contact his or her dispatch for assistance. Shipping documents, which can be found on the driver's door pocket or on the front seat of the vehicle, also contain a 24-hour emergency contact phone number that can be used to get assistance. In an ammonia nurse tank, less than 10,000 liters, there may not be shipping documents present in the vehicle. In this case, the 24-hour emergency contact phone number should be used to implement the emergency response plan. If the incident is at a facility, the 24-hour emergency contact number can be found on a sign posed at the front gate. A copy of the emergency response plan can also be found at the main entrance to the site, most likely in a blue container. Blue is the industry standard for anything related to emergencies and emergency shutoff or closure devices. For example, emergency shutoff devices are painted blue. It is important that the correct response personnel be identified as quickly as possible. The owner of the product is generally responsible for providing emergency response to an ammonia emergency. Contact information for this response may be obtained from an employee, signage, bills of lading, or emergency plans. 
The owner's emergency response plan may invoke a system from another agency, such as a manufacturer or an emergency response contractor. The emergency response plan is the primary route for obtaining expert help. After the scene is secured so people are not in immediate danger, the most important thing in an emergency is to identify the person or company identified in the ERAP and activate their emergency response plan as quickly as possible. The inhalation hazard presented by ammonia means that rescue and mitigation be done by properly trained and equipped personnel. The correct resources can be identified and summoned by calling the appropriate ERAP activation phone number associated with the load or fixed facility. This information is found on the transport documentation or in the facility emergency plan. Canutech is the Canadian Transport Emergency Centre operated by Transport Canada. Canutech can provide information and advice on the dangerous goods to emergency responders and can provide assistance in identifying and locating emergency response personnel trained and equipped for dealing with dangerous good emergencies. For agricultural anhydrous ammonia, manufacturers of the product can provide expertise and have trained emergency response capacity. All agricultural operations handling anhydrous ammonia are required to have an emergency response plan. Emergency contact information is available at the site or on the bill of lading for transportation incidents. In a rural agricultural incident involving anhydrous ammonia where there is no release of product, for example a road accident where a vehicle is transporting anhydrous ammonia in a means of containment, the response remains the same. A perimeter must be established as the product is stored under pressure and the integrity of the containment is not known. Anhydrous ammonia containing equipment should not be disturbed until expert help is available. Remember to check the wind direction when setting the perimeter. If possible, pre-planning with facilities that manufacture or use anhydrous ammonia is a key activity and can dramatically improve emergency response methods in an incident. This is especially true in smaller centers where hazmat expertise may be less readily available. In review, remember mitigation of an anhydrous ammonia emergency should be left to properly trained and equipped personnel. First response should focus on securing the scene and initiating the emergency response plan. Next, we'll go through some basics on first aid for anhydrous ammonia. The only first aid treatment for anhydrous ammonia burn is water. Getting large amounts of water on a burn will minimize the damage and lessen the pain. If a person has inhaled anhydrous ammonia, it's very important to seek medical help as soon as possible. High concentrations of anhydrous ammonia inhaled into the lungs will cause lung damage and symptoms can develop long after the initial exposure. If the victim has difficulty breathing, it may be necessary to administer oxygen. If you're not qualified to do so, seek qualified medical help immediately. If a victim is safely able to do so, drinking liquids will help flush their system of the ammonia. Do not induce vomiting as anhydrous ammonia is caustic and will burn on the way up. If the victim does vomit, put them in the recovery position to prevent any ammonia vomited up from getting into the lungs. Anhydrous ammonia is readily absorbed by water, so eyes and lungs are particularly vulnerable. If ammonia has contacted the eyes, flush the eyes with water for at least 15 minutes. Emergency water should be available whenever anhydrous ammonia is used. Ammonia will produce chemical burns to the skin upon exposure. Exposed areas should be flushed with water for at least 15 minutes. Continue flushing as long as possible. Contact with liquid ammonia may result in clothes being frozen to the skin. Do not attempt to remove frozen clothing until it has been thawed by flushing with water. If a continuous source of fresh water is available, continue flushing the exposed area with water to keep the area moist until the victim is transported to the hospital. Follow your local burn and pain management protocols. Lotions or creams should not be applied for the first 24 hours after ammonia contact as they can trap ammonia under the skin, making the injury worse. And hydrous ammonia will destroy latex gloves, so use nitrile gloves if available. If not, use at least two pairs of latex gloves. In summary, remember these very important steps when dealing with someone with an anhydrous ammonia injury. Move the victim upwind to safety if safe to do so. Remove the ammonia by flushing with water, remembering that ammonia may be frozen to the skin. Flush any exposed tissue with water for a minimum of 15 minutes. Administer oxygen if the person has difficulty breathing. Transport the victim for more medical assistance once they are decontaminated. Do not take their clothing or personal effects in the same vehicle 
as they may still be contaminated with ammonia. This section provides information on the environmental effects of anhydrous ammonia. Anhydrous ammonia is used as a highly effective fertilizer for crops. However, if released into the air or water, anhydrous ammonia can have detrimental environmental impacts. In an emergency situation involving anhydrous ammonia, any ammonia released cannot be collected and placed back in its containment as it will evaporate and dissipate into the atmosphere. If this happens, the priority is to remove those in close proximity and in the area downwind to keep people out of the path of the release. When released in the atmosphere, anhydrous ammonia can end up in two forms. The first, in the form of rain, occurs when ammonia is absorbed by water in the air and end up acting as fertilizer as it rains. The second is as a pollutant, as ammonia may combine with other pollutants in the atmosphere to form particulate matter, which contribute to smog. In an emergency situation, trained personnel may dispose of ammonia by either burning it in a special flare or sparging it into a water tank. The resulting solution of ammonia in water is checked for concentration and spread on cropland as fertilizer. Anhydrous ammonia or water contaminated with ammonia that is released into streams, lakes, or wetlands can raise the alkalinity of the water which may kill fish and other aquatic animals. As a concentrated nitrogen source, ammonia in water may also contribute contribute to growth of algae and other aquatic plant life which may degrade the normal ecosystem. In an emergency situation, most ammonia will end up evaporating into the atmosphere. However, in some cases, water may be used by trained personnel to mitigate the incident and water contaminated with ammonia may run off into nearby waterways. The only action required in these circumstances is to sandbag ditches or culverts to prevent contaminated water from reaching waterways. In summary, the hazard to the environment from anhydrous ammonia in an emergency situation is relatively minor since most ammonia released will evaporate and dissipate into the air. Waterways may suffer some damage if contaminated with ammonia. This video focused on responding to a rural incident involving anhydrous ammonia for agricultural use. Anhydrous ammonia is a highly effective fertilizer, primarily used in Western Canada. It is applied in liquid form to the soil using specialized farming equipment to grow crops. All ammonia vessels must have the proper identification, including a TDG placard, so that a vessel can be quickly identified as containing anhydrous ammonia. The words anhydrous ammonia, inhalation hazard, must also be found on the vessels. Handling an agricultural anhydrous ammonia emergency is a complex issue. It can involve a variety of people and resources, including those immediately responsible for the incident. Agro-retailers, manufacturers, emergency services, and provincial and federal agencies must work together in a concise and efficient manner to minimize injury to people and damage to the environment. In a release identified as ammonia, your first priority is to keep yourself from becoming a victim. Should a release occur, do not approach the incident. Ammonia released from its containment may be visible and will drift away downwind as it dissipates. Move yourself and others in the area upwind. Ammonia is corrosive in nature and will produce chemical burns to the eyes, lungs, and skin. This type of burn is susceptible to an infection. Responding to an incident with proper equipment and procedures is vital, as exposure to high concentrations of ammonia can also be deadly. Facilities supplying agricultural and hydrous ammonia have emergency response plans outlining the steps to follow in case of an emergency. This will cover site, transportation, and customer-related emergencies. It will also cover environmental impacts, security, and theft. Plans include the emergency contact information for individuals and businesses who should be contacted within a minimum of 5-kilometer radius. The most important thing in an emergency, once people are not in an immediate danger, is to identify the person or company identified in the ERAP and activate their emergency response plan as quickly as possible. Proper personal protective equipment must be worn when responding to an incident. It's important that facilities and first responders work together to ensure emergency response plans are executed properly. As first responders, you may be the first on the scene of an emergency involving anhydrous ammonia fertilizer. It is vital that you know what to do. Fertilizer Canada encourages you to contact your local facility or ag retail location to learn more about anhydrous ammonia and conduct in-person response training. For more information, please visit fertilizercanada.ca.